And Brit helps both large corporations and small businesses with insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com. Well, Marcia Kavanaugh, thanks so much for joining us. Well, it has been just another week in government watchdogging. To save $2 million, the state may have lost $42 million in Medicaid payments. And there's disappointment over Katrina class action lawsuit payments. We'll look at those stories as well as more tension stirred by the monument controversy and how government has handled socially sensitive issues in the past, as well as strategies for local homeland security. And our Future Watch segment examines the status of the Audubon Nature Center. On the trail for us are tonight's Informed Sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, David Hammer, investigative reporter, WWL-TV Channel 4, Don Ostrom, Channel 12's Future Watch reporter, and Jeff Adelson, reporter, the New Orleans advocate. We go over to David first, and you had a report about how we tried to save some money during the general administration, not paying a, a $2 million payment to a company that helped us collect Medicaid money, so therefore we've lost millions. Yeah, and we don't know exactly how much the company that's responsible for collecting these payments estimated 42 million, but because nobody was doing the work for a long time, they're not really 100% sure. But basically what happened was when we were facing this $1.6 billion budget deficit, the largest in the state's history under Jindal, and they were scrambling trying to come up with ways to save, he did cut out this $2 million contract, annual contract, to recover money that Medicaid pays up front for Medicaid uh, eligible patients when they're hurt by somebody else or there's another insurance company that's responsible because Medicaid is the insurance of last resort. Mm -hmm. So there's, for instance, you could uh, someone who qualifies for Medicaid might get in a car accident and when liability is finally established between the insurance companies, the insurance that's liable pays for the medical bills. But by that time, Medicaid has already paid for this person's medical mm -hmm. care and if nobody's watching the store, then Medicaid, there's nobody there to say, hey, actually, insurance company A, yeah, you owe this money. Us. Right. So that wasn't being done for over 14 months mm -hmm. uh, after the contract expired at the end of 2014. And when the new administration came in, uh, Governor John Bell Edwards, uh, Louisiana De uh, Department of Health came in, they hired somebody and they did an emergency contract. It was actually the same company that had been doing it. And uh, they started collecting and they collected nine million so far. But in the interim, you had this, you know, tens of millions that wasn't collected. Can it be recovered? Well, they say that they're trying to collect all of it and may potentially recover it, but the auditor who put out this report actually about a month and a half ago said that they think maybe 18 million of it is completely gone because you have to make a claim within three years, and those claims are more than three years ago that Medicaid paid them. But there's and some it, dispute about that, too, isn't there? Right, well, there's a, an interpretation in that the you law, do that it market? says that you have to make claim within three years, but you have six years to collect, and the state believes that they can get an additional three years to actually do the claim and collection at this point, and the auditor doesn't agree. The attorney general is concerned and sent a letter to the Department of Hospital of Health. Uh, it used to be the Department of Health and Hospitals, right, now it's Louisiana health. Department of Health, and said, you know, you got to get on your horse, you got to give us everything that you've got on this, you got to tell us what you're doing, you got to show us all the details and uh, assure us that you're trying to recover this money because the Department of Health had $40 million cut out of it this year right. to try to deal with the budget deficit. And think about it, if it's $42 million that they weren't recovering over the last several years, they may have been able to continue with some health services. So this was just a lag time of 14 months, and we're talking well, about were, perhaps that much money? Well, there were actually two gaps. There was a 14-month gap, then there was an emergency contract, then there was another gap of about half a year before they were hired, to, before they were able to, because they just couldn't go back far enough because it, they couldn't keep up with it because it's stuff that's coming up constantly. So if you miss 14 months and then you're hired on a nine-month emergency contract and there's another gap, you're really uh, 
behind the eight ball. So the, within the Department of Health, I mean, there just is not staff enough or a division within the Department of Health to go after this? We, we have to contract outside to get this work done? Well, that was the point that was made in the audit, is that they didn't identify somebody else to do this function under the Jindal Department of Health and Hospitals. Mm -hmm. And when the new Department of Health came in, they hired this same company back. But this is actually very specialized work that only a few companies in the whole country do. So the question is, is there somebody who's actually able to do that are they they're short staffed already there are a lot of concerns and the feeling is that it had to be outsourced and when they didn't actually uh, outsource it they ran into these problems so it's specialized work but for something that seems to consistently happen where you have to go recoup these monies for the state well here's the other thing they moved to a managed care system in Medicaid uh, back in 2012 kind of gradually starting in 2012 and that the hope was that that would take care of it because there's a company that's already hired to look after these claims and they would do it naturally as a part of it but there's still fee-for-service payments meaning the direct a la carte payments that the state's responsible for and that racked up a potentially this $42 million that, that wasn't being collected. All right, David, thanks. That's a lot of money, and definitely the Department of Health needs it. And it just goes <laughs> right. to show that you spend money sometimes to make, to make money in money. government, yeah. and sometimes you can be penny wise, pound foolish, whatever yeah. cliche you want to throw out there when you cut. All right, David, thanks a lot. I'm going to go over to Jeff right now. And the monuments controversy, which got started up in late 2015, maybe mm -hmm. is coming to a resolution? Yeah, I think we're sort of in the final uh, act of the, uh, the monuments controversy, although that's certainly something that uh, people <laughs> thought before. Yeah, true. Um, this week, uh, starting on Monday, uh, federal appeals court ruled that um, ruled against uh, uh, an injunction against the city that would have kept the monument, kept three of the monuments, the ones to Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and PGT Beauregard in place while a, a trial brought by some uh, supporters of the monuments played out in a federal district court. Um, and then on Wednesday, the um, another ruling came out from that district court that said that despite a uh, consent decree that dates back to uh, the 90s when uh, um, the Bartholomew administration tried to remove the, uh, the Battle of Liberty Place monument, mm -hmm. that's the monument to the white supremacist group, um, the... Um, uh, the, the court ruled on Wednesday that that uh, consent decree does not prohibit the city from taking down the Liberty Place monument. So it looks like all four monuments are likely going to be uh, taken down sometime uh, within the next uh, several months. The city's sort of looking to get uh, all four down by uh, end of May. Is Liberty Place fast-tracked now to come down first? Uh, it, it's not fast-tracked to come down first. They're actually, uh, from what I'm hearing from the city, they're still working on exactly how that process is going to work because the ruling came just a couple days after, or about a day after, the city put out a bid to take the other three monuments down. So they're seeing if they can adjust it, put all four together. Uh, there's also a possibility, uh, you know, Liberty Place is a bit smaller, it's a bit less uh, complicated than some of the other monuments, so there is a possibility that one the city might be able to do on its own, uh, as opposed to going up a 60-foot column to take down uh, the Robert E. Lee statue. So yeah. the city has private funding to get this work done, but they don't have anybody to do the work yet? Uh, they don't have anyone to do the work yet, and that's been a problem in the past. Um, they never uh, sort of fully said who was bidding on the last round of bids, which was interrupted by um, the the appellate court putting a temporary block on, on taking him down. Mm -hmm. Um, and that that seems to be because um, you know the original bidder received, uh, said he received death threats uh, and, and his car was later found uh, burned. Um, some of the other uh, people that had expressed interest in bidding or even just you know clicked on the link on the city website and said, "Hey, I want to know more about this," and their names got public, uh, and they all got. Uh, harassing call saying you'll never do business in the city again if you take down the monuments. So there, there is a question about whether they're even going to be able to find a contractor, um, you know, within the next uh, 25 days, which is the bidding process. Well, the city is eyeballing May as the time when it comes down. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. That's uh, what the, the contract would call for. And it's a public contract, right? So they would have to. There's no yeah, way to go around the right. public. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The the uh, the winning bidder is going to have to be made have public. To come forth. And, uh, you know, the bids are secret until mm -hmm. uh, 
until the contract's over, but that has nothing to do with the monuments or security. That's just general bid process to make sure that no one's undercutting anyone. Where are the monuments like going to go once they come down? That's the big question. Uh, for now, the city says they're going to go into a warehouse uh, where they're going to be stored until uh, a permanent, uh, what the mayor has said is either a museum or a park where they can be put into the proper context, uh, can be identified. No one knows what that is. No one knows what's going to replace them. No one knows. Right. Next Mardi Gras, what will we call the parades as they get too many? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, that, that's all a very and good does, question. Does the pedestal come down too? I got a question about this and I didn't know the answer to it. Uh, no, it doesn't. The, just, just the statue. The, the just statue. the statue. The, and, and a trial. Is that still in play? Uh, there is still uh, potentially going to be a trial. Uh, the the, um, uh, the ruling really only affects the um, the request to, to block the city from taking the statues mm -hmm. down while the trial plays out. Um, it, it is um, it is worth noting that both the trial court and the appellate court have basically both of their rulings basically said, you know, we've looked at these arguments being made by the people trying to keep them up, and we don't really see a lot of legal or constitutional merit to them. So that doesn't bode well for, for the trial. And of course, once they come down, you they're know, down. they're down. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right, Jeff. Thanks. Errol, you just also wanted to address, I mean, obviously in this situation with the monuments, there's strong opinions on either side, and we've gone through things like this before. Yeah. I mean, hearing about this, you can't help but thinking about the, uh, with remember the Dorothy May Taylor controversy in 1992. Uh, she was a council member at large and she introduced an ordinance that in, in effect would have eliminated uh, discrimination of several forms in Mardi Gras, not just race, including gender, uh, which was something that the female crews weren't too, too happy about. And it caused, it caused a lot of furor. The council meetings it, it had the, the same sort of anger and it's pretty much the same sort of uh, rhetoric that you heard at, at the council meetings for, uh, for this. And, and there really was some hurt feelings and, and, and just a, a lot of bitterness. What was different about it, that process, though? Um, and I think it's something just to think about, especially when you have an issue that's racially sensitive, is that the council created a Blue Ribbon Committee. And it was given pretty much a year to come back with a solution. As full disclosure, I was asked to be in the Blue Ribbon Committee, so uh, I accepted seeing that this would count for time in purgatory um, <laughs> uh, later on, which it should, okay. Uh, and it was, uh, at first it was just a, an awful committee to be on, but in the long run, it was a good experience. And it would happen, it wasn't really black against white. I mean, over time, there were clusters and coalitions that developed. Uh, the guys in Rex and, uh, and Zulu had more in common than maybe some of the women's crews, and they had different different interests. And, and so it was, it, it was a good way to have really just good discussion and not the kind of yelling that you have uh, at council meetings. And there were several meetings throughout the year. And then at the end, there was a, a resolution that came up, an idea. And I can tell you that the person who came up with the idea that ultimately became the law, which was a system of, uh, of having to sign a statement saying that you don't have the uh, discrimination group, was a black attorney who worked for one of the uptown uh, uh, law firms. And that Mayor Bartholomew uh, really, I thought, did good work behind the scenes trying to bring, bring people together. And at the end, when the vote came from the Blue Ribbon Committee, it was unanimous in favor of this plan. And it was brought to the council. And with the council, it was, it was unanimous. And I think at the end, there was a feeling of citizen involvement. I mean, in a sense, Dorothy May Taylor got what she wanted. I mean, there was some fallout from some of the crews. On the other hand, there were some things that were in the ordinance, uh, such as criminal penalties that people found uh, objectionable that, uh, you know, that were taken out. And I thought it was a good citizen's process that you don't see in this. This is one person. I mean, it was the mayor saying, this is the way it's going to be. And true, the council voted for it. But for council, especially an urban council, it's hard to vote no on an ordinance like that. Uh, uh, their vote was six to one. However, had there been an ordinance saying, let's create a committee, let's create a commission, let's study this, let's come back in the year, I'm sure, I'm sure the council would have approved that too, more eagerly. Uh, so I, I don't know, it's just what kind of strikes me about this whole thing is the lack of a process um, out there. And there, there's just a lot of feelings about this, and it's, and it's wrong to say that people who are feeling bad about losing the monuments are just doing it because of the Civil War or racial things. I mean, to a lot of people who were raised in New Orleans, it was part of their backdrop, it was part of their, their life, it's something they've seen all their life. Well, as I said, there are strong opinions one way or the other, and it does appear that the monuments 
will be coming down fairly soon. Seems that way. It seems that way. All right. Thanks, both you guys. I'm going to go over now to, to David. And um, Homeland Security is a concern. I mean, it is a concern that we seem to be getting more and more concerned about. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to talk to Jeff Solette, who's the special agent in charge of the FBI here in New Orleans. And he brings a really unique perspective when he came at the end of 2015 to run the FBI office here. He comes from having been an FBI agent in New York during 9-11 and an agent in Boston during the Boston Marathon bombing and actually was in charge of the investigation that led to the Tsarnaevs being hunted down mm -hmm. uh, for the marathon bombing. So he came in here a few years ago, a year and a half ago, and noticed some weaknesses in our defenses. And he really likes to point out that the threat has changed and I think the sense has changed from the citizenry that it's not just the World Trade Center and the mm -hmm. Pentagon and these big national targets that could be targets of terrorism. And certainly all of us saw this, it was a, a lot of us saw it up close, the concerns after the Endymion crash. I was actually right nearby and was doing some of the first reporting on the scene and a lot of the feedback I got right away was, is this terror? Is mm -hmm. this terrorism? It turned out it was somebody who uh, was, you know, his alcohol level was three times the legal limit and it, it has nothing to do with terrorism. And fortunately, the police chief was able to make that known quickly. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. The and that tamped that spread. down, the panic, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, and as, uh, uh, Agent Solette says there's a big difference between somebody who rolls out of a car drunk and somebody who comes out after running into a bunch of people shooting. Mm -hmm. And But tactically, there's a lot of things that you have to be ready for, particularly in the French Quarter, which is a very compact area, narrow streets, and fronted by a river. And the ingress-egress mm -hmm. issue is major when you have French Quarter Fest and 750,000 people are coming in over the course of a few days. Right. So. Those issues are things that he brought to bear, and one of the big things that I just learned about, and that's why I wanted to do the interview with him, was that they had tourniquets pre-positioned, professional level tourniquets pre-positioned on Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras floats in parades like Rex, not all of them, but in a few of them. And they had uh, police and tactical gear at the edge of the French Quarter as a deterrent display. We had this $40 million plan that was introduced by the mayor and the governor uh, a few weeks before Mardi Gras that included making a pedestrian mall on Bourbon Street, more high definition cameras and lighting. All of these things are part of the Homeland Security issue as well. Are we going to be seeing more? Yes, that's what I'm told. And, uh, you know, I talked to John Casbon, who's a leader in the community, both with Mardi Gras and with the business community and the Police and Justice Foundation. And he says, expect more. It's not something they're making a big public display of, but they're working behind the scenes. They're doing tabletop exercises. They did it with the All-Star Game. And they are always at the ready in a way that they really weren't before. And in your report, there seemed different to point out that the police are the first line. Exactly. And that they're a backup. But that's exactly. And they are ready with their assets in case they're needed, like they were with the Endymion thing. But, uh, and as somebody who was part of the reporting on the, uh, as, uh, as Jeff was with the NOPD mm -hmm. call waiting series with the slow mm -hmm. response times, I got to point out now, their response was Extreme, extremely rapid. Of course, it was Mardi Gras, and they're already deployed in a way that they're not at other times. But they were very quick, and EMS was incredibly quick in getting ambulances in there and getting people out of there, and it avoided much worse casualties, not casualties, but injuries. But Homeland Security, I'm sure, is something that has been thought of and, and dealt with for years, but now the strategy is just kind of being tweaked a little bit, it sounds exactly. like what you're saying. Right. It's not that it wasn't there before. They have that unit at the FBI even before Salat yeah. got here, but he brings a special interest and focus to the job. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. Over to Don now. And I can remember going in the 80s, 1980s, taking my kids and their friends over to the Audubon Nature Trail, but it was closed after um, it was Katrina decimated. on the east in Joe Brown Park, but it's coming back. Decimated by Hurricane Katrina, completely destroyed, not a structure, and a lot of the forest actually destroyed too. Um, it is reopening, the Nature Center is reopening for the first time since Katrina on Earth Day, which is April 22nd. There will still be some work being done, it won't be completely done, but um, more than a mile of boardwalk nature trails reopened. Um, also replanted Louisiana uh, uh, low-level forest, which was destroyed. They've planted more than 1,600 native trees, shrubs, and flowers. 
um, but they're in a race against time against invasive Chinese tallow that they have to get keep the tallow down so the trees can get up. The trees eventually are stronger than the Chinese tallow, but in that time before the trees are up high enough, the tallow can take them over and they're chopping away. So there's always volunteer opportunity out at the Nature Center. But they do say that the Nature Center will be different. Many of the nat Nature Centers around the country were built in the 70s and 80s. And it was at a time where we, uh, where in that world, you had to go somewhere else. Nature occurred somewhere else and you had to go to see it. The idea now is nature's everywhere outside of your house um, and they're trying to make the Nature Center feel that way. Um, a large cathedral-like structure that's air conditioned where you can look out upon nature and see it and be part of it. Uh, nature playscape where children can play in a safe environment but there's also shade. Um, that's a great thing for New Orleans East too yeah. because right. Joe Brown Park has these great facilities for athletics and, and then it was to just have missing just, the Nature Center, right, which yeah. had been there, uh, built by actually by the Junior League of New Orleans in the uh, in the late 70s. There's 3,500 square feet of exhibit hall with that cathedral type ceiling. That won't be quite ready yet by Earth Day. Um, before Katrina, they had 21 school partners, mostly with schools in New Orleans East and St. Bernard and St. Tammany. They're getting back in with the, some of the same schools and a lot mm -hmm. of the new schools. Um, so it will still be a very educational experience, but the visitor center and the trails are open to anyone starting on April 22nd. It's free of charge. There's a planetarium back on site there. And you know the, the beauty of having the whole facility decimated and rebuilt is that they now have 2017 technology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which maybe they wouldn't have had without the destruction and the FEMA funds that spent more than 12, 12 million dollars to get the facility back up and running. So uh, the digital technology with the planetarium will allow them to download more programs. So there will be programming for the community, but mostly it will start with the school group programming and reaching out to the schools in the area and then move on from there. There's also, uh, many people remember the big glass greenhouse structure that was there. Um, it wasn't completely destroyed, but lots of the glass was blown out. They're tr still negotiating with FEMA to figure out how to rebuild that. Still. And rebu still. And how to rebuild that safely. So that won't be open yet, um, but it is coming. And, and it's, can remind me again exactly where? I know New Orleans, New Orleans East, but where? Uh, Joe people? Brown, it's at Joe Brown Park. It's bounded by Dwyer and Lake Forest Boulevards mm -hmm. and a canal. If you go to Joe Brown, you can, get, you can there are two different entrances there in the east, so. Um, so field trips, field trips, this fall, uh, for the field fall trips starting this spring. late spring, spring. Uh, starting <coughs> after the week of, you know, as Jazz Fest mm -hmm. happens, so will nature be happening to other kids. I mean, it was a great place for field trips. <laughs> I went to a lot of field trips there. Yes, um, so, so there, and there are the ball fields and the walking paths next yeah. door at the, at the park, but then the nature center's back open with nature trails and exhibits and you can learn about our low level shrub forests and cypress forests and there, the forest closest to the nature center was not destroyed, the acres closest in, but as you get out on the trails, you can mm -hmm. really see where the new planting is needing to happen. And yeah. you know, and they did stress several times today, if anybody, if groups are looking to do community service work, they're always looking for help battling right. the Chinese tallow and replanting okay, out there. Great. Great. Great, Don. Thanks a lot. Over to David now. And folks started getting letters uh, this past week or so about some Katrina class action settlements, maybe for ooh, 52 cents is what they're going to be getting. <laughs> Not quite that low, but no. close. I mean, this is, a lot of people just forgot about this. You know, after uh, Katrina, people were encouraged to join a class action mm -hmm. lawsuit against the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, contractors who built the levees, all of this for the levee failures and for the Mr. Go, the effects of the Mr. Go, uh, Mr. River Gulf outlet right. uh, on flooding both in the New Orleans East and the Lower Nine and then in the bowl of the city mm -hmm. with the failure of the flood uh, walls on the outfall canals. And the uh, claims went in and it took until 2013 for there to be a settlement and by that time the Corps of Engineers was out because they were found to be immune right. by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals from this type of lawsuit. And so it fell to the uh, three area um, levy districts, the Orleans Levy District, East Jefferson and the Lake Bourne mm -hmm. Levy District and they had 17 million dollars in insurance money that they could pay. And over the course of time, there's about $3 million added in uh, uh, interest. And so you have $20 million to split among potentially hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. of claimants. Well, they ended up with 120,000 claimants, so you could see something with some, you know, several hundred dollars 
per, but what you ended up with was an average of $118 per, and you have people who got these letters saying, don't contact the court, this is what you get, and some of the awards just didn't match up with what their experience was and what their claim said. Someone who had a claim where they showed the death certificate for both of their parents, and a death claim was supposed to be the highest payment that you could get per death in your family, got $3.22. And another person who lost their home in, uh, in Chalmette, where the highest flooding was, and the f house was knocked off of the foundation slightly and everything, like big time flooding, he gets a letter that says, you didn't live in the flood zone. His wife gets one saying, you get $110 for some contents damage. And his son, who was 12 at the time, gets $56. So it, they're saying, well, what do I do now? I can't contact mm -hmm. anybody. And that's what my story was about, was that, you know, yeah, there's this settlement. And the guy who actually was the main lawyer on the settlement, Joe Bruno, said, you know, I tried to tell them that this just wasn't enough money for people. We should put it to a public pur purpose. And the court basically laughed me out. And now we're dealing with this. And also, there were non-residents or visitors who were granted claims. And that's what that $3 amount was supposed to be for, was for somebody who was a visitor and had a claim as a visitor. Well, this lady who <laughs> ended up getting basically a visitor's claim, and she lost her parents. So when will these big checks? And I mean, the maximum amount is I understand is about three thousand. Yeah, there are a few people who got three thousand dollars. I don't have a total breakdown on exactly how many got how much, but. The, no, no, none of the checks will be able to go out until after an objection period, okay. but like I said, it's very limited in who can object, and they have to do it by mail, so okay. it won't be until after the uh, April, May time frame before checks start going, All right, going David, out. All right, David. Thanks. Time to look ahead. Daryl. Okay, well, the big story today is that Kenneth Pulley, the U.S. attorney, announced his resignation effective March 24th. Of course, it touches off a lot of speculation. Uh, was he forced out, or, or is he thinking about running for citywide office? Okay. This will be uh, pres one of the first president Trump's first appointments of a new U.S. attorney. Okay. David. Well, I'm going to be watching Katie Moore uh, at Channel 4 and Jim Mustian at The Advocates reporting on the uh, travel and campaign donations issues with the state police, uh. the Troopers Association. It's a big story, and uh, more is to come. Okay. Don. For more than 50 years, the Trinity rummage sale has been going on, and you know there have been some news anchors in our town who have said it's definitely not rummage. It's no. high, high designer suits and that sort of thing. Um, but it goes on again tomorrow and raises money not only for Trinity Episcopal Church, but also for grants throughout the community. Time? Time tomorrow, I believe, 9 to 5. Okay. All right. Thanks. Jeff? Well, uh, Helena Moreno threw her hat in the ring for the at-large council, uh, for one of the at-large city council seats last night. So I think we're sort of f formally in the uh, campaign season, and we'll see a lot more of that. And so it begins. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for being here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And, of course, we want to see you again next week for Informed Sources. Have a good evening. The firm of Bowen, McCled & Britt helps both large corporations and small businesses with insurance, risk management, and employee benefits using the same values they've held true for over 30 years, knowledge, vision, accountability, and service. More information is at bnbinc.com.